Hi everybody, welcome to Stress Free Lounge. I'm your host Bill Little here for another uh, enchanting evening of uh, elegant uh, wit and uh, top level philosophical uh, discussions. Um, but that guy's not here, so unfortunately I'll be sitting in for this week and uh, we hope to have somebody like back there soon. Boy, I miss those hot mic jokes. You know, it was just, I just really, that was, you know, I just remember before uh, before that show went about weren't able to keep it going with the NRA, weren't, weren't able to come to an agreement. And I remember just about a week or so before uh, we got into those contract negotiations, they said, um, we kind of like, we don't think you should be doing this hot mic thing. And I just thought, mm, the... Um, the pop, uh, the pop structure, uh, pop, the c pop culture strikes again. Uh, it's my favorite part of the show. And um, anyway, uh, I miss it terribly. I really do, because uh, I could never really do them in advance. I'd usually just, uh, you know, I'm in the chair. We got 30 seconds, and I had to figure out something. But it was a fun way to make fun of the LA uh, crowd. But in any in any event, here we are. Uh, so we're going to do uh, part two of our um, of our computer gaming, video gaming, uh, and um, we'll be doing questions this time because I think I did the rant the whole time last time. Uh, Dave Big Booty wants to know what my shirt says. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's uh... now you may or may not remember that that was probably around nine, eh, 2009, 10, um, and it's faded quite a bit since then. It was for uh, Right Network that Kelsey Grammer was involved with, and it never actually got off the ground. Uh, the, I think their distribution deal fell, off, fell through. Um, but I remember seeing their graphics and their, and their layout and everything, especially when we were working at the previous establishment. And I thought, man, live. Um, th this, uh, these people really got it down. There was like a, there was a, like a, a trade show or something. Maybe it was at CPAC. It must have been it. And everywhere, these gray banners with this. And like I said, this is pretty faded now. There's just this electric orange. Uh, but this is an actual logo. Look. I mean, it's just cool. And it's been one of my favorite, uh, favorite shirts ever. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I guess, it, you know, once again, uh, just when just when things look like they're getting to be fun, uh, there there it goes. Um, so anyway, uh, here we are back in the uh, in the world of computer games. I've been working on uh, Unreal Engine four for the last uh, week since we spoke last. Uh, you know, it's like two days to install this uh, Sky plugin that does these photo real clouds. I finally got that done. I've been working mostly on landscapes because that's still pretty easy. Hoping to have one rendered out tonight. And I set up the camera and I set up the camera motion and I previewed it and everything looked great. And I go to make the cinematic, and um, and it kept rendering a different viewport. I don't know why. I've done this in seven or eight different kinds of um, software before, and and it just I. I could not find how to get this thing to render the right viewport. Camera was moving in the previews. Everything in the previews looked good. You'd hit the render button, and then it would render something looking out the back window. I'm sure people that know what they're doing could have fixed that in 10 seconds, but it took me about two and a half hours. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, slow uh, progress while we uh, continue on waiting to get ourselves a hold of uh, you know actual professionals. Um, that said, uh, they uh, these landscapes really look great, and and after the uh, last week when we did a little bit of um, machinima stuff, grabbing stuff from in game, I thought, man, just why am I going to all this trouble? Why, jeez, really, Bill? I mean, just just grab it from the engine, just do it, you do it now. And I thought I thought about that a lot, and then I, I spent a couple of days, well, you know, a couple minutes. Over, over the course of a couple of days, kind of tooling around on um, the various uh, planetary landscapes in, in the Star Citizen world and 
Then I looked at some renders that were photorealistic renders done with Unreal Engine 4, and there's just no comparison um, at all, none. So um, that's where we're going to be. I'd love to have Kelsey Grammer uh, voice a character for me on Star Trek. Do I have that on? No, I got it on the other one. Um, what was that? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, I got, um, I got, I was pulling some videos to put together, uh, for, for this kind of condensed, super condensed version of this pitch that I still have. I've got like a 15 minute version and that's too long. And, and I've talked to a couple people about it and they said, well, we'd like to know something. And, you know, so I'm going to try and get this thing down to seven minutes, six, seven minutes, just bullet point after bullet point after bullet point. And I might go over that a little bit tonight, but, um, while I was doing it, I was looking for examples of the uh, of the latest um, the latest renders that Unreal Engine was doing in terms of uh, realism, and and it was really I found something really cool because I'd been thinking for quite a long time that this that this could be done. Mike Rowe, Border Jedi. Oh, my God, Mike Rowe. I know Mike Rowe. Oh, he'd be fantastic. Um, wow. Anyway, so here's the thing. Um, so I was looking for these uh, animations and, the, and, you know, these really top-end facial rigs and, and, you know, constant, um, you know, morph targets and all this nonsense. And I saw... Uh, an animated 20 second head and it's this really, really photorealistic, great looking uh, black guy. And he's doing this thing. And I thought, what, what the hell do I know this from? And what he was doing was he was, um, he was doing the, the Jack Nicholson thing from a uh, few good men. But the beautiful part of it was it was the actual recording. Um, he <sighs> time stretch for the win. Uh, what if Micro did an an Aurora Republic episode of Dirty Space Jobs? That's just fantastic. That's bloody marvelous. Uh, anyway, um, all of this to say that what what happened was they had this really, really, really good looking black guy, a real, real good photorealistic, uh, uh, unreal character. But they had but they had lip synced him to Jack Nicholson. Just lifted the line out of the movie, deepened the voice just a little tiny bit. Enough to get um, to get it to sound just a little bit. There's no question it's the lift from the movie. The cadence and everything's exactly the same. And so basically, the way they got that done was um, somebody, you know, says, "You can't handle the truth," and and they're just lip syncing to to um, to the lines from the movie. But since the lines from the movie are pre-recorded, what they're really just doing is they're capturing the facial data. And um, and so I saw this this uh, very very believable. I want to say, you know, early 30s uh, black man saying Jack Nicholson's lines. And the sync and everything on it was fantastic. So um, the, uh, the good thing about this is if you really um, think about it, you could get, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not making any promises uh, of any kind at all. But some of these people I do know. I know I know Mike Rowe. I know Kelsey. I don't know Kelsey Grammer very well. I know Kevin Sorbo pretty well, and a few others, Gary Sinise and John Voigt. Um, and having been around this business for uh, ten years, uh, there's a very, very, very big difference in terms of whether somebody can record something for you at their house versus them coming into a studio, sitting there, getting into the motion capture thing, doing, you know, doing all of this stuff. And it's really, it's a, it's a difference between, you know, 15 minutes of their time or, um, you know, half of their day or a full day. And that's a significant difference when you're dealing with, uh, with people. So, um, so one possibility is to get, um, one or two just really good actors and mimics more than actors really and then you basically would send out the script 
um, virtually all of the people I know at, at that level have their own um, recording studios in, in-house. They, they're either doing Skype interviews or the, somebody needs something, certainly the voiceover actors do. And they just, um, they just record it. And I could send a script. They could do one or two reads. I don't, I don't have to be their director or anything. Um, and uh, then we would get that audio file. And then we'd hand it over to an actor Ideally, we'd get an audio and video file, like a Skype file. And then the actor would just basically, somebody, you know, inexpensive, uh, could sit here and just practice, 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 until finally he was lip syncing with the movie, at which point you get the facial motion capture that you want, you put that into the engine, and you use the original recording, and it's essentially, it's, it's kind of the way they make um, musicals. It's probably not... I mean, most most everybody knows, that, I'm sure, that when they're watching a musical number like um, Greatest Showman or something like that, any, any kind of musical number, uh, most people know that they're lip-syncing, obviously. But what most people don't know is really, uh, I mean, it's it's so obvious, but it just doesn't occur to most people. And that is you have to finish the soundtrack, or damn near, before you start shooting the movie, because when those people are on stage lip syncing, they're lip syncing to to the music, and the music has to be more or less locked down and and finished. So, um, it's a it's a very strange thing to see uh, a, a movie set where they're shooting a musical, because you would you would just naturally think that all of the musical presence and and all of that stuff. Um, would be there, but it's not. It's just a pretty crummy, sometimes just a boom box, you know. And, um, but when you put the two together, it's absolutely magic. Uh, I uh, did something, and I didn't move that either, did I? Wait, I might have that. Hang on a second. Um, I did something very, very simple, but really important. Uh, I think I might have that, actually. I could probably just drop this in pretty easy. Uh, and that is that uh, this thing we did last week with the... Um, uh, the machinima where I was talking on the out on the landing platforms at Port Olisar. Um, I did something very, very simple. Uh, and what that was was I put a radio filter on it. Where did I move it to? Did I put it on a floppy? On a, on a, I bet I did. I put it on, um, I think I put it on a flash drive. So I did a, I mean, that thing was five minutes. wouldn't put you through that again. But I did a, I did a cut down to about two minutes and um, and just having that radio effect, it's is it's amazing how much um, how much better. I want to say better really mean more believable. Simple things like that are because you're watching. Um, Scott has been here and he can testify to the state of this spotlessly clean desk. Uh, you're watching um, this video and you're seeing all this stuff going on and you're hearing stuff and it, and it doesn't match. It just doesn't sound right. So when you can just, just put that, it's super easy to do. You just put that real thin, uh, you know, real tinny, um, uh, well, where the hell are you? Where would I have put you? Oh, I put you on the uh, Google Drive. That's where I put you. Hang on a second. So, um, so just by just by putting this tinny radio filter in there, it gets much more believable. And I did, like I say, just a super fast two minute cut, and I'll I'll just grab it and, and chuck it up there because I don't have to do anything to it really. Just give me one second. Unless it was cleaned off by, uh, yeah, maybe it was. Gosh darn it! It's got to be here someplace. I don't know. Yeah. I'd forgotten all about it. It should have been in my in my folder here, but apparently it is not. Oh well, I'll have it. I'll have it next week. But it, it was it was really cool. I've got a longer one, but I wanted to show Oh there it is, there it is, there it is. Sorry, 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 here it is. Um so we're gonna do this. Uh, excuse me for one moment while I launch a, a new scene. Hopefully it'll be worth it, and if it's not, then it's not, but it won't take very long, so give me one moment, and uh, and we'll see if we can get this done. So uh, stay with us, and here we go. Uh, yeah, 
Hi everybody, I'm Bill Whittle here, standing in front of magnificent uh, Port Olisar, here at the heart of the Stanton system. Uh, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. You. Okay. Nice job. Come here. Come on. Come over here. I don't know what's really going on. I just... Stuck here. Wondering what the hell's going on and uh, kind of, you know, just curious about when I might be able to get the hell off of this damn rock. Oh, look, look, here goes somebody. Watch it, you knucklehead. That is a spaceship. It's a Mustang. I don't particularly like them, but, you know, not everything for everybody. Somebody's going to get in that thing and fly away in just a moment. Here comes somebody. Oh, check it out. Here comes a pilot. I'll just wave to him even though he's behind me. That's, that's the spirit. Get up there. Fight these guys. Kick their asses! Not much, really. Um, doesn't take much to do it. Uh, my wife was so uh, amused that I said, kick their asses. I, I was just, <laughs> that was a case where uh, there are just a bunch of preloaded motions like that, and I'm just tapping keys, and he just did that. He did the kind of, the you know, the big fist pump kind of thing, and I just threw it in there. Uh, as I said, I think last week our very own um, Foghorn F-16 uh, demonstrated six, I think it was, six of these, um, they're called emotes, they're, they're pre-rendered uh, animation files that'll, you hit the button and it will make your character do something that's visible to other characters, and we had a competition, uh, and there were, you know, 2.2 million people signed up for Star Citizen, and, and Mr. Foghorn uh, won, so he got to go direct some motion capture, and that was pretty cool, source of great pride for us. As was, um, as was our very own uh, Lisa, uh, who had never played a computer game in her life before a couple of months ago, uh, getting out there and coming in second in the great uh, Daymar Rally, which was a race across the planet's surface. So anyway, we were having fun with that. So, 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 so. Um, that, is, uh, that is pretty much that. So we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to do the questions from last week that we didn't get to do. Uh, I do want to talk for a minute about the new site uh, and going forward because a couple people have asked about it and um, and uh, Scott's there and uh, has done just astonishing, he's just done astonishing work. And normally I would tease him about that, but since he's not here, I can, I can tell you he's done really great work, if you know, needless to say, don't let it get back to him under any circumstances. Um, so... We're not just change, we're not just uh, the, it, it's essentially up and running, and the the rollout of this because I'm a big showbiz guy, you know, I like I like big rollouts, I like just big surprises. Ta-da! Uh, this is not a way to run a business, or certainly a way to run a website. I know he's here. I saw him earlier. No good for nothing. Um, get back to editing, um, and and so I like the big reveal, the big surprise. Um, and uh, that didn't work out so well. Uh, so, um, so Scott's been uh, doing the thing the right way and just getting it working. And then we invited a few people in, invited a few more people in, and a bunch more people in. And and now it's pretty much open door over there. Uh, in the next couple of days, we will change the location 
so that it will it will it will live at billwhittle.com. The current website will stay at billwhittle.space, uh, but that will just be for um, for the transition uh, period. And as uh, as I've said before, you know it's absolutely astonishing. You can you can sit in the in the uh, on the website and and watch the stream live and put together comments and questions in there. I have no doubt. Eventually, I would um, we'll be moving pretty much everything to there. So here's here's what's going to happen. Um, I know there's some people going to hear this and they're going to panic a little bit, but I just think it's just. It's just the realities of, of life uh, today. The, the good news is we're not giving up the political stuff, needless to say, and, I'm, and I've got a couple of uh, potential firewalls in the, in the bag that I'd like to get up there and out there. But because of what's happening with YouTube and um, Facebook and all the rest of this and all of their exceedingly successful efforts to cut our sources of revenue off, where we are going... Again, hold on to your uh, seatbelts here. But basically, where we're going to be taking this thing is, we're going to be um, we're going to be producing content for members, and then we are going to do um, edited down two or three minute highlights, and and I don't mean compressed highlights. I mean here's a good two or three minutes from the right angle. Here's a good two or three minutes from uh, Bill Whittle now and so on, and we'll make those available on YouTube to the public. But, um, you know, I've, I spent uh, 10 years uh, concerned about how many, um, how many uh, views I could get. And, and after the course of about 10 years, I realized that, um, you know, a couple thousand people, and most of them are watching this now, uh, were paying for videos that, in aggregate, have probably been seen by 80, 100 million people, something like that. Now, 30 million of those views is me checking the counters, but nevertheless, uh, it's a it's a pretty big deal. So, we um, we're going to set this thing up so that if if you remember, you go to the website, you not only get to see the videos at all their length, but you we we have an actual real community which the Stratosphere Lounge uh, crowd uh, is, is the, um, you know, it's kind of always been the nucleus of that. But people will be able to put their own posts up. They've already done it. Uh, they'll, they'll be able to follow one another, you know, chat with each other, connect with each other. You'll have all of your information, your credit card information, your picture profile, all of it will be right there. Um, so um, Victoria uh, Pax mentions the, the, the key issue here, which is, well, if it's only uh, members are the only ones who get to see the full content, isn't that kind of preaching to the choir? And, um, and the whole purpose of this is to, you know, is to get the message out there and the word out there. And uh, I think that that's an excellent argument, and I have no doubt that when we have something, you know, we think is really solid, we'll put it out there. But we have to just, we have to look at the world that we live in, you know. And, and the world that we live in um, is a world where lots and lots and lots of people, lots and lots of people have been watching this for 10 years. And, and they're used, the internet is free and TV is free. So TV on the internet should be free and it's not free. So um, it's going to make uh, membership a lot more attractive and since the stuff that we'll be putting out uh, will be three minutes instead of 12 minutes that should be um, that should be uh, you know enough to grab people's attention maybe we'll do the um, yeah Scott's got it right he said it's more like equipping and encouraging the choir to go out there and sing and um, choir's been singing for a long time and, um, you know, uh, they had their little hat out there at Christmas Eve and, uh, you know, and, and, and just wasn't a whole lot of people chipping in, in hay pennies. Uh, so the three-minute highlights of these shows should, should do better on YouTube than, um, than the 15 minutes versions do. And uh, this is the reality uh, of the word. This is, this is it. 
uh, as a couple people in the contents uh, in the comment section are pointing out, it's a um, it is a uh, three minute attention span out there, and that's um, really the main reason that I was able to make this decision and go with it, um, because to the degree that um, the entire purpose of the of the membership is to get the message out there more people who have not already watching the shows or gotten the message, more people are going to see the best three minutes of a show than they are uh, all 15 minutes of the show. So um, that's about it. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I know it's, it's annoying to people and I know it's, uh, it's frustrating, and not only frustrating. I know it's it's just actually a pain, you know. And you get you have to get your credit card out, and you have to, you know, put this stuff in. It's much easier now than it was, but it's still not as easy as just clicking on things. But reality is reality, um, and and it really is just that simple. We have had s pretty much the the same people watching. We made enough appeals to to this uh, mailing list of 14,000 people or something uh, over the course of the last couple of years that really generated, you know, very little. Hardcore members came over, um, were here in the beginning, and many people came over from PJTV when PJTV closed. But PJTV had a large number of members because if you wanted to watch something on PJTV, you had to be a member to watch it. And I have been basically... I mean, here's my, here's 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 my business model. You know, prior to doing this, my business model is um, convincing people to uh, pay for something that's not only free to them but free to everybody else. The product is free, and and it's and it's difficult to find uh, enough people who have that kind of uh, vision about things. And when we were, uh, you know, before we got suppressed and our numbers were chopped and tenths you know we used to routinely get two three four hundred thousand views now it's twenty thirty thousand views so um it's uh it's just what we have to do so um let me see some here uh, that's an interesting question from anchor man is i'll just read it in its entirety glenn beck on a show today said that we have the facts behind us, but not a good story. The Democrats control the story. You've said this yourself many times, and making this move is going to stop your message from getting out there. We need to start controlling the narrative. Well, needless to say, um, Anchorman, we uh, have um, we have looked at that argument very, very seriously. Uh, there, there is. There are two. There are two missions really here. Um, and when I started doing this, even back in the eject, eject, eject days, I thought my primary purpose was to try to um, change people's minds. But I discovered after after a pretty short time that my my primary purpose was to be handing out ammunition to the guys on our side. Um, and you know, 350, 400 firewall afterburners later, I've done a fair amount of that. To the degree that we're going to get new members um, out there, with these three minutes, things will be shared, and we're going to obviously be having to bring back the firewalls because those are the things that got people's attentions. And I know I've got um, I've got two of them that I could uh, really much ready to just crank out and do. Um, one of them is called "White Johnny Can't Think," and uh, and those obviously will be will be out there for everybody. But this is the economy of the world that we're moving into, and um, and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what else to tell you. Um, it, it is something like this, or else uh, we 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 have to either keep this thing going or we don't. And I don't suspect things are going to stay this way. But um, in any event. Uh, I see. I, I actually have to read these comments. These are important. 
Okay, yeah, Scott's pretty much got that covered. So look, here's what we're doing. For people who want the full 15 minutes of, of stuff, who really understand the nuance of it, that's going to be available to members, and, and that's what they're paying for. Um, and we're going to try to get as many members in there as we can. Uh, we have n almost never anymore gotten below uh, you know 10,000 views on Right Angles and and Bill Whittle Nows, and, um, and those people are consistently watching the show. So, you know, if, if, we had, if we had that base audience as memberships, we could do, we could do fireworks, uh, firewalls a week, and we could also do uh, most of this uh, video game stuff if, if we were to be able to convert that. But so we are looking at the realities of the world where we're basically saying to ourselves, um, we need to we need to build this community, and this community um, is then going to be able to take us to, to the places where we need to go. And and when 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 I hear that you know that your message is to is to get out there and change people's minds, I've been working on that message for a very long time, um, very long time. And when I say that, I mean for the last year and a half. Uh, and my ability to change people's minds is going to be dedicated largely to the um, to the to the video game messaging because the people's minds whose need to be changes changed have a three minute attention span and they want to watch lasers and 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 uh, drive around on on planetary surfaces and blow people up with uh, spaceships. So that's the reality of it. Um, the stuff that we continue to do for the choir is there for the choir because there's a lot of people out there that think that, you know, that like to hear how these, how these values um, applied. Um, yes, uh, Cheryl's right. Um, so um, it is, it is it, it's the reality of the world. I mentioned on one of these shows, I think the last Bill Little Hour we recorded, I said the reason that you, you should uh, be able to, um, that you should become a member for, I think Scott said, 33 cents a day, is because I am, um, I am lowering the cost of your laundry detergent and your soda pop, and I'm lowering the cost of your potato chips and peanut butter and, and beer, because we used to think the television was free, but television wasn't free television was paid for by advertisers and while it's been a long time since i watched uh, network tv that idea that every seven minutes somebody's going to come in and talk to me for three minutes uh is uh, not only annoying but if you think about it what happens is tide spends millions of dollars on advertising um to put a commercial into the middle of friends let's say and those millions and millions of dollars of advertising money that they spend are reflected in making the product a little more expensive. They didn't have to advertise. They could charge less for it. Um, and, uh, and since we are not being paid by uh, Budweiser or Tide, that's money they don't have to spend. So actually, we, we, we're keeping those uh, costs low for you. Um, we also have, you know, we also have a, a, a tremendous uh, library. It's just a huge vault of stuff. There's hundreds of these firewalls and afterburners. And um, one of the things we need to do is to get, um, is to be able to get the resources to get uh, some, some editors here full time and, um, and go back to these, you know, eight or nine minute firewalls and, and, and make, here's, what, here's, here's two minutes on, you know, why the inner cities are so bad. Here's two minutes on education. Here's two minutes on, on, on whatever. And um, we kind of just repackage those and get those out there. So it's just a, uh, it's just a question of, of the changing environment and the changing world. And um, so Martin Archer says, I think this is just formatting the same stuff in different ways. You, I think you're not thinking outside the box and doing cultural shows that are not primarily political is the way to bring more people in. 
I couldn't agree more, and that's why um, that's why we're going to go and do um, actual entertainment for um, young people, and, and that's where a great deal of my focus and effort has been. So uh, I'm I'm not only thinking outside the box; I'm thinking outside the box that the box came in. Uh, so um, there you go. Uh, with all this stuff going on here. Yeah, so anyway, that's the, um, that's the plan. Um, and, and as, uh, uh, as Times Judge is pointing out, even though he is a despicable miscreant, the, 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 you, you just can't, be, you can't get the economics of it out of the way. If I could do this without any members at all, it, it, let me rephrase that. I, I love the members, and I love having them here. If I could do it without having to charge memberships at all, I would do it. And if somebody were to come along and, and say, here's, you know, a couple million dollars, just uh, put these things out there for free and, 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 don't, um, and don't worry about it, that would make me exceedingly happy. But that's not the case. And, um, and it's a product, and it costs money. And large numbers of people have been um, basically consuming that product and, and not paying for it. And this is where it leaves us. So uh, that's what we're going to do. We're not, we're not going to bottle the content up. We're not going to lock it up behind a paywall. But we are going to make sure that um, membership is, is, is worth something. Uh, so that's the, that's the basic overall plan. Now, if this turns out to be a catastrophic failure, the good news is that it'll be Scott's fault. And, um, and I will be able to... Uh, you know, basically blame that on him without groveling too much. I can get enraged and put up a quick title sequence and saying that, that the people, um, uh, the people responsible for sacking the previous people have been sacked. Um, so that's where we are. That's that's what it is. That's what it's going to be, uh, and um, and we'll see how it goes. But uh, one way it is going to go, we think, and and um, and Cheryl pointed that out is that uh, this, this new site is not just a new site. Uh, it's, um, it, is, uh, it is a community and it is providing things um, that uh, it really is, it's, it's fellowship. It's you know, people who are um, of a like mind talking to each other and, and not just me. And, I want to get Scott to do some some more commentary. I'd like to get Zoe Rachel in to do commentary. I'd like to one one of the things we definitely have the ability to do right now with the website is if uh, any of you have something you want to write or something you want to link to, there's a way to do that. And um, so lots and lots of, of uh, member member generated content is coming in too, and that's why there's no picture of my smiling face on the on the website uh, because we're trying to broaden it its appeal and have it be something that's for, you know, just more, more content. And we're putting out 10 shows a week right now, and, um, and we have to do this in order to get the resources to put out more. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, anyway, um, let's take a look at the questions that we swore we would answer last time. Who else from PJ? I just have to answer. Who else from PJ Media would you want to bring in, even as guests? It was a pretty thin crowd of people who I personally liked. Um, uh, I've already, you know, made an enormous compromise for the quality of the site by bringing Scott and Steve over, uh, but I did that, frankly, out of I almost said compassion, but it's closer to pity. Uh, Steve Cruiser was interesting. Um, uh, Steve Crowder was there for a little while. Uh, Alfonso Rachel, by far, I thought was the best was the best piece there. Uh, there was that um, there was that bald guy that did that show with a really good looking dude. I forget. Yeah, slipped my mind. Um, and I'm looking back on it, and I I can't think of you know just a, a whole lot of uh, of people there. Um, so again, this is uh, this is the reality of, of, of the world of today, and um, 
and th these are the these are the rules that we have to play by. Tammy Bruce was very good too. Yes, yes. Tammy Bruce was was I thought very interesting. Um, and um, oh, a couple of the guests we used to have on routinely were were pretty neat too. Anyway, we're going to work it out. The main thing is um, these things are up and running, and that's basically uh, basically it. Uh, bring on Candace Owens. I did I did the first. I think I did the first on-camera things that Candace Owens did. She was the first person to call in on those 60-second SmackDowns. Um, but now TPUSA has got a, uh, is basically getting an enormous production house. I mean, uh, apparently just an enormous studio in Phoenix. And, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm reading the comment section here, which I know is not really fair to the YouTube people, but I really don't know what else to do about it. I don't think anybody else does. Uh, it would be nice if there were, if, if over the course of these years, we could find people who would really get behind this and, and spread the word. But one of the things that we found out and continue to find out is that, is that conservatives just don't get it. They don't get it, and um, and it's just incredibly frustrating. And and the just by happy coincidence, uh, the hot mic example I gave at the beginning of the show is um, is a is a great example of that. You know, we're doing something really fun and cool, uh, and it was a little thing, but it was it was a cool little thing. And then of course it's like. Um, Next thing you know, uh, uh, you, you can't do something that, that interesting and that cool. Um, and, and by the way, um, the, uh, one of the things that I, I wanted, that I've heard about other people doing, um, and that is like these, I'd like to do this little historical, um, we're not really stepping back, by the way, Edward. We're we're we're, we're stepping forward. Um, we've been putting out more regular content over the last four months than we have ever done at any time here. Um, but but one of the things I'm interested in doing are um, I'd like to do little ten or fifteen minute um, favorite moment in history kind of things. You know, this is. Uh, some of them will be well known, others not so much. But like I would, I, the first thing I'd do is Taffy Three, just immediately, um, uh, and I and just just because I love doing those kind of things, just just for fun. Um, but I happen to think the stuff we're doing at Bill Whittle now is really just important and cool. I mean, we spent ten years, Scott and I and Steve and and everybody else. So we we spent ten years working on understanding and explaining the philosophy uh, and what Bill Whittle now does and what we want to do more of is we is basically saying, okay, now that we've got this understanding of what conservatism really is, we've collated it from so many different so, so many different sources um, that I love the idea that now we have now we see that we've got we've built this, philosophy. I didn't build it. I didn't invent it. It's just, you know, I understand it now. And um, we, uh, we, I think it's interesting to have that philosophy, that political philosophy, um, not only questioned, but, but thrashed, you know, just like, well, you say this. Yes, I say this. Well, what about this? Well, my answer to that is this. Aha, but um, that means that you're hypocritical about this. On the contrary, it's all completely consistent. And um, and I just, I, I love that show because since I don't know what's coming, I often surprise myself with the answers. And that is not uh, bragging. That's just a question of, of, of me really just understanding and wanting to share with as many people as I can uh, how consistent and um, moral and decent and 
productive and successful this conservative idea is. These ethical traps that, you know, pull progressives down on everything they do, raise taxes, give me every tax deduction you can. Public schools only, send my kids to public, private schools. When you, when you understand this philosophy, there's really nothing that Scott's been able to throw at me, and he's trying pretty hard, that has ever had me go, hmm, um, uh, I guess I was wrong about that or hadn't thought about that. It's, it's really just there's a couple moments when I have to think about, well, where is the freedom here, and where is the decency, and where is the common sense? And it's like, oh, okay, that's it. There it is. And we just talk it through sometimes. M many of the times we just um, – I, I'm just kind of hashing out in my head as we go, and uh, Scott has the um, has the talent to to ask those things that actual journalists used to do, which are probing questions and then follow up questions. And if this philosophy is worth living, and it certainly should be worth defending, and defending it is fun, and um, and that's that too. So you know, just to wrap this up, uh, this aspect of it up. The, the world is changing. I can feel it in the air. I can smell it in the water. Um, it's not the same world that, as 2009, 10, and 11. Uh, everybody who's out there now, Crowder, uh, uh, Ben Shapiro, um, obviously Rush and Levin and, and Beck and everybody else, are doing, they're not doing firewall type stuff. They're dealing with the issues of the day in a way that, that it kind of advances the philosophy. So uh, that's basically it. I still have a couple good firewalls in me. I just uh, basically got to the point for a while there. It's like, I just, I just don't know what to say about socialism that I haven't said already. Um, and now I have some, some new things to say. So uh, we'll be trotting those out in the not too distant future as well. And needless to say, they'll all go wide and enough about flogging this dead horse uh, into the ground. I'm looking forward to, um, to, uh, to this community and I'm looking forward to this sense of community. And um, even if it's just a few thousand people, you know, the remnant is the remnant and living in LA, I heard some things uh, from a meeting I went to last uh, weekend, a political meeting, Republican, local, local Republican meeting. And, and what I heard that is coming in California actually really genuinely scared me. Um, I don't have all the details, this is from memory, but essentially California uh, allows vote harvesting, which means that on election day, um, the Democrats Republicans too, but we don't know how to do these things because we have a certain core integrity. But it's possible in California for at somebody at five o'clock to look down the the rolls of voters, see who did not vote, who did not vote yet, go to that person's house with a ballot, have them fill out the ballot and sign it, and then the person that drove over with the ballot drives the ballot back and and deposits it. And you know as well as I do that if somebody gets stuck in traffic uh, and um, it turns out that we had five or six uh, state representatives uh, and, and, and national representatives uh, who, were, who were winning on election night, Republicans, and some of them by 14 points, and we find out two days later that they found all of these extra votes that all went to the Democrats, so it turned out we lost the elections after all. They're saying... They're saying this is it, that is legal now. What I heard last weekend is, and you just think about this for a minute. There's talk about by 2024, closing 75 percent of the polling pre of the polling stations. Think about the the genius of this from the point of the left. If you eliminate three quarters of the places where you can vote, you are essentially tripling or quadrupling the line at the places where you can vote. And you would ask yourself, well, why would anybody want to do that? Well, it's pretty simple, really. If all we did was just go and vote the way we used to, that's actually pretty difficult to, to steal. 
And so not only are they going to be saying, oh, no, we'll come over and, 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 and pick up your vote, as if somebody's going to check that signature, as if somebody's going to check the signature and come in with 100 votes, dump them on a table. They're all signed by different people, as if somebody's going to check and make sure that these are unique signatures. So just, it's just a way for Democrats to manufacture votes. And the genius of eliminating uh, three quarters of these polling places is that actual citizens like myself often can look. I'm, I'm voting no matter what, but you know, if if it j just think about it, the people who are working can't afford to spend instead of two hours, they can't afford to spend six, seven hours. Um, and not only can't they afford it from work, but it, they're just not ready to go through the misery. So they're gonna they'll do what they're what everybody else is doing, which is sending and mailing in the votes. So the and the and the period of the election, you can mail in votes for I think they were saying four weeks or something. Four weeks prior to the election, just mail them in. And if it turns out that a Republican happens to be ahead, well, we can fix that problem very easily by doing the old, um, you know, uh, what's his name, Al Franken trick. Hey, we found a whole box full of votes that all went to Al Franken. We can't deny those people their voice. Uh, furthermore, I heard that, uh, I don't know if this has already passed. I think it has. Just listen to this. In California, you cannot perform any work for the state of California. I don't know if that means being hired by them, but it certainly means as a consultant, if, you, if you've got a paving company or something, the state of California is legally prohibited from using your services if you have ever been a member of the National Rifle Association or if your company profited from slavery in any way. So you just think about that for a minute. Um, it's, it's the law here. It's the law. It's legal. These are the kind of issues now that, that need to be dealt with. These are the kind of issues that have to be challenged. And... Um, and uh, that makes it much more of a specific kind of a counterattack. It's not so much of a here's, you know, here's, here's how much money the federal government spends. You know, here's, um, here's uh, uh, eat the rich. Here's why we suck. Here's um, th th those days are kind of behind us now. We are really now dealing with a two-minute two population span, uh, attention span, and we're dealing with people who are in the government who are so sure of themselves that they have set up, they have legally set up a system that guarantees that they will never lose another election again. Um, so, and they wonder why, they wonder why we won't give up our, our uh, AR-15s and our, uh, you know, our pistols. And then it's just a matter of time. We'll see it by the end of the decade. We'll probably see it by 2026. Uh, without question, we'll see it by the end of the, when it's the end of the decade, I mean the end of the 20s. We'll see it by the, by the mid-20s, certainly. It will be online voting. You will click a button, and your vote will go to a machine. And whether or not it's counted, counted by whom, along what basis, there's no accountability. There's no paper trail. There's no, um, there's no uh, anything. They just, Stalin got it. He ought to know. He's a big socialist, too. He's one of the greatest mass murderers in history. He said it doesn't matter who votes. It matters who counts the votes. Um, so these, these are the things that we're facing now. We're facing... Um, governments, both state and federal governments, that um, are spending money like there's no tomorrow because they're convinced um, because they, uh, they, they're not worried about tomorrow. They're worried about today. Um, so anyway, on that cheerful note, uh, 
they are they are doing everything they can to make sure that the American people don't ever get to hear the other side of the story. The American people made the wrong choice in 2016 because there was somebody else out there telling them that Hillary was, you know, maybe not as cool as people thought. And after losing in 2016, the left took a year to get over being stunned by it, six more months of temp temper tantrum. And then they realized, well, we just have to make sure that nobody hears about Hillary Clinton's emails and nobody hears about Benghazi and nobody hears about any of these things. We just gonna, we're just going to shut them down. And, um, and that's what they're trying to do. And Alfonso Rachel is one of the great voices of conservatism, used to be in a room filled with uh, like a convention room speaking to three or 400 people and rocking the house. Now he's in the same hotel and he's in the same room, but he's setting up tables and putting tablecloths on them and serving as a waiter. And that's what happens when your team decides not to not to pay for what they're getting. What do you say? I mean, I, I wish it was different, and, and it sounds depressing. It's, it's certainly not cheerful, but I am always come back to the remnant thing. I always come back to this idea that it's not the numbers of people. It's not the, it's not the numbers of people. It's the quality of the people that matters. It's the quality. But when I found out... Um, when I found out that, that, that Zoe was waiting tables... Uh, so it was on Clavin's show a couple of days ago. Isn't that interesting? Oh. Um, uh, I heard that from him, and I, I just wanted to cry because I heard it from him at a live event, and he was just, I, I've never seen him better. He was fantastic. So um, we'd like to get him in here as well and, and spread the word and make that membership uh, worth uh, as much as possible and then see if um, we can get more people to become members and keep this uh, fire burning. That's the, that's the plan. All right, so um, moving on now, uh, we'll definitely do some questions because I'm basically blabbered on for another hour. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay. Uh, let's uh, separate the Facebook panels and make everything possible to read on my tiny little monitor. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have time to do that. Foghorn, I'll tell you what, Foghorn, let me, um, why don't we close with that? How about that? Uh, Foghorn has um, suggested that we play uh, a video that um, was made by uh, known miscreants and, and blowhards, uh, and it's actually kind of fun. So we'll we'll close with that, but I don't want to I don't want to get get to that right now. We'll run it just as we just as we get done. Yeah, Martin Archer says he's depressed now. I'm de I'm not depressed, buddy. If I was depressed, I'd I'd move to Montana, and live on beans and buy ammo. Um, we are doing this to keep the lights on here, and these video game this video game thing. You know what? I'm gonna just go ahead and give you the pitch for this, because I don't want to leave on this note. Okay, so. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'll still get the questions, so help me. I will. But here is why you should not despair, and here is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I used to have it on my desktop, and I don't know if it's still here. Let's see. This one I should have on the drive. Give me one second. Just give me one second, because this will actually cheer you up. Cheers me up. But, um, it's a question of, you know, uh, of vision. So hang on a second. It's, uh, where did it go? Uh, here, here, here. There it is. Okay, hang on, standby coming. Just pull this over here. And now... Um, I am going to make a new scene. It's going to take just a moment, so please forgive me. And uh, But this is worth looking at, so give me one moment. And i got to put my voice in there, too. You are going to be... Well, apparently you can still hear me. That's good. Uh, so uh, that saves us a little bit of trouble. Here comes um, my entire pitch... Uh, for this entire idea of this, um, these kind of videos that I've been working on for so much time is based on uh, this 
uh, image that I'm about to show you. Which is... Right, you. Yep. Okay, here we go. Um, here's why you should not give up hope, and here's why I'm um, doing what we're doing, and here's why people that think oh, Bill's backing off or retreating are um, understandably, but um, they're but they're mistaken. So um, this is a map uh, of what the uh, country would look like if the vote was held tomorrow and only millennials voted. This is what happens if only millennials voted for president tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> that's not what the country's gonna be in five years or 10 years, it's not, it's not speculation. It's if you take people who are under 30, this is the result you get, and if you take if you take white voters out of the equation, the entire map is blue. And the reason the map is blue is because they paid for it to be blue. They've spent tons and tons of money for it to be blue. And the reason it's blue is because they've understood that the best way to get people to vote the way they want to is for them to hypnotize you. And I always do this during live shows, and it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Hang on, hang on. You gotta, gotta let me get to the point here, guys. Just, I'm, I'm just, just Everybody just be cool. My job is to scare the crap out of you, and then and then tell you why, why maybe you shouldn't scare the crap out of you. Okay, so uh, how many of you out there have ever been hypnotized? I ask this uh, to a lot of uh, the speaking engagements I do. How many of you out there have ever been hypnotized? In a room full of 200 people, you might have four or five people raise their hand. And my response to that is, uh, well, um, unfortunately, you're wrong. You've all been hypnotized. Everybody who's watching the show right now uh, has been hypnotized. And on some level, you're being hypnotized at this exact moment. Um, You've been hypnotized hundreds of thousands of times, and you've been hypnotized, uh, furthermore, you paid people to hypnotize you. And this is not just a, a catchy phrase. I can, prove, I can prove it to you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I'll start a couple sentences and you can finish them for me, okay? Uh, because they've been hypnotically planted in your head. So I'll do it two or three times for different age groups. Uh, and here we go, ready? I'm gonna start a sentence, you finish it. Um, look, up in the sky, it's a bird. You know, and everybody in the room goes, it's a plane, it's Superman. To which I respond, okay, well, did you have to think about that? Did you have to get out your smartphones? Did you have to check your notes? Did you have to go to the Superman website? Did you have to look up, you know, uh, George Reeve on, on um, YouTube. What was he said at the beginning of, um, of that show? No, you know it. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman stands for truth, justice, fill in the blank. Truth, justice, in the American way. You know this because you have been hypnotized by watching Superman. When you go to a movie theater and you sit in a dark room, it's Saturday afternoon, you got popcorn and, and, a, and a soda next to you, you're sitting in a room for 400 people, middle of the day, you're watching a vampire movie, and all of a sudden, this creature comes out of a shadow from a castle 200 years ago on the other side of the planet, uh, outsteps a creature that you know doesn't exist, you fully know that vampires don't exist, but it scares the living daylight. You jump out of your seat, why? Why? Well, because you're in a hypnotic state. It is hypnotism. It is hypnotism. Astronaut said that's not hypnotism. It absolutely is hypnotism. Hypnotism is the ability to get below your consciousness, to, 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 to make an end run around your rational thinking, your, your, your uh, cerebral cortex. It goes into a state, I'm not sure about this, I'm pretty sure it's theta waves, but you go into a state where you where you are no longer processing things with your brain. You are now have opened a pathway that goes directly into your subconscious. And you do it on purpose. It's called the willing suspension of disbelief. When you go to see a Star Wars movie or Lord of the Rings, you go into that movie knowing that you're going to see spaceships 
turning and banking in space, and you'll hear lasers, and you'll see that light travels slower than sound in space. You're going you're, you're gonna to see all of this stuff. You're going to see a guy who lives in people's dreams with knives for fingers. You're going to buy all of it. And when you go into that movie, you make a deal with the filmmakers to say, I am going to allow you to hypnotize me for two hours, but you better make it entertaining. And many of the times they do. So in a state of hypnosis, you watch movies and maybe there'll be vampire movies. Maybe there'll be something else. A country that spends hours and hours and hours a week being hypnotized by movies like It's a Wonderful Life and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is going to be very different than a country that is hypnotized by watching hours and hours and hours of um, shows like Empire or movies like, uh, oh God, it's hard to pick, you know, one of the darkest ones, uh, you know, Redacted or, or whatever, the, whatever the case may be. So you, when you watch a movie, you're hypnotized. When you watch TV, you're hypnotized. When you listen to music, you're being hypnotized. You have lowered your, um, your, your rationality to, to enjoy the entertainment. Now, here's the good news. That map is blue. Let's go back to the map. It's blue because they paid for it to be blue. And, um, and when I say they paid for it to be blue, I'm not talking about trivial things like um, George Soros putting in 33 billion, b b billion with a b, 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 33 billion dollars into things like, um, uh, you know, um, I forget, media matters and all the rest of these things. That money that they spent is trivial. The money they spend on politics to make this map blue is trivial. The real money they spend to make this map blue, they paid for this map. They bought it. They bought it. And they paid for it with probably trillions of dollars, certainly hundreds of billions of dollars, of entertainment, music, movie, media, everything, all of it. It's all getting you when you have this hypnotic state of passivity and, and relaxation, and it's blue because they bought it. Now, that's the bad news. The bad news is, is that map is real. It's not a potential. It's not might happen someday. It's not the, the you know, here how's, how things are going to be in several years. This is today. So here's the good news. Take a look at it one more time. Um, this Dark Order says remembering words is not hypnotism. No, everything that you got in Superman, everything that you got out of that show uh, is exactly hypnotism. Um, so here is, uh, here's the map. This is not how people pretend to vote. This is how millennials vote. If you look at how they vote, this is how they vote. If you ask millennials what they think, they will tell you that they're socialists and that they and that they uh, vote for Bernie Sanders. Um, but if you ask them or look at them and find out what they do, then you're going to find some very interesting news here, because these millennials call themselves socialists, vote like socialists, but they're not socialists. They just think they are, and we can prove that very simply by just quickly marching through that ancient story I've told, which just happens to be one of the most illuminating moments of my life. I go to Oberlin College. I'm looking at the students. They say they're socialists. I say, okay, socialists, bring down the smartphones. We'll take them downtown. We'll go to a, to a, a pawn shop. We will um, uh, we'll sell them. There's easily $2,000 worth of electronics here. And then we'll take $120 bills and we'll, and we'll go around the, the streets of Cleveland and hand out money to homeless people who are in greater need than you, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. You've got smartphones. They don't have food. Bring them down and, and let's start redistributing some wealth. And none of them do it. None of them do it. None. And the reason they don't do it is because they're not socialists. That's why they don't do it. If you really lean on them, they'll say, this is my phone. And, um, and they're right. So why don't we go back to this map again? Here's young people in America. They vote for Bernie Sanders. They really do believe in socialism. But if you ask these people to give up their um, smartphones, uh, they won't do it. And they won't do it because they want their property. 
they think that redistribution means taking other people's wealth and redistributing it to them. But when it comes time to redistribute their own wealth to other people, that's an entire nation full of rock rib conservatives, William F. Buckley, every single one of them. So what that map is showing is it's showing what they say. It's showing what they think. It's even showing how they feel. But what it's not showing is what they actually do. This map is a picture of what they are pressured into thinking and believing, and they do it. But what does that blue map do? What do they actually do when you leave them alone for the few moments a day when they actually get left alone? What does that blue map do? Well, that blue map spends more and more and more time in video games every single day. And this is why I'm doing the work I'm doing here. Think about this. All of those people are spending more and more time in, in video games and the pop culture with things like Star Wars and fandom and Avengers and all the rest of it. They're spending more and more time in those worlds every single day. Why? Well, what do you do in a, in a computer game? You do two things in a computer game. Virtually every single computer game out there, virtually without exception, consists of doing two things. You make money and you buy weapons. That's it. Uh, that's all. And I like to make money and buy weapons. And so what you find is, is that that blue map of millennials has retreated from this world of the social justice warriors and immerses itself in a world where they get to act like conservatives. When I see elderly people who say, I, I just never see my grandson anymore. He's in his room playing computer games and we can't get him away from him. We can't pry him out of there with a crowbar. I get to say to this veteran, I say, well, sir, I'd be willing to bet you a significant amount of money that your grandson is in there doing that because right at this very second, he's shooting Nazis and jumping out of C-47s over Germany. Or he's, um, or he's fighting the Japs. Or he's killing bad guys. But I guarantee you that he is not inside that room of his stuck to a computer game where he gets to fill out forms and then, and then go and march in a, in a street protest in, um, in you know, photorealistic graphics. A video game came out recently called Red Dead Redemption. It was an excellent game. Uh, people were really looking forward to it. Red Dead Redemption made $550 million in three days from millennials. Millennials spent $550 million so that they can play cowboys and Indians in peace. See how it works? See what's happening? I'm going to concentrate on the men. There's a similar story made for women, but let's just concentrate on the men. These young men are told that they're rapists. They're told that they're defective girls. They're told all of these things, and they're told it all the time. And they know how strong that peer pressure is. I felt how strong it is. And it pushes them into a world where they simply say, no, you're right, I'm a Christian, white, male, heterosexual. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 I'll do whatever I can um, you know, to, 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 to make up for it. And, and, they, and, and they believe this. And that's why the second that that bell rings, or whatever, they're out of there like a shot. They're in a, they're in a room. They turn on their computer. They got got a can of Mountain Dew and some and some um, Doritos, and for the next four hours, eight hours, ten hours, weekend, they are playing cowboys and Indians. They're playing soldiers. They're driving fast cars. They're blowing things up. They're chasing hot women. They're getting rewards like a pat on the back from father figures that they never had. They have escaped our world and gone into the world of computer games because they want to act like conservatives. We don't have to change their mind, don't have to change their behavior at all. They're already doing it. They're already doing it. And one of the reasons that the time is so ripe for us now is because the left is absolutely, absolutely furious. And for once, they're not furious with conservatives. They are furious with the left. Religion, we think religion has disappeared from this country. You can't make, this, you can't make religion disappear. There is a religious need in everybody. So why aren't people going to church? Well, they're not going to church because they're told that being a Christian makes you a racist and a homophobe and all the rest of it. So where does their religious instincts and passions go? Well, for that generation, their religious 
uh, motives are channeled into the one religion that we have in post-Christian America, and that is Star Wars. And Star Wars is not a movie for, for many of these millennials, not just a movie, not just a series of movies. It's a religion, and it has all the aspects of a religion. You've got a Messiah figure. Uh, you've got the um, you've got the wise old uh, prophet. You've got uh, the the father who is um, you got the good father in heaven. You got the bad father in hell. You've got um, afterlife. But most importantly, most importantly, by far, what Star Wars does for people religiously is it gives them a code of behavior. The Jedi have a code, and. The Jedi Code is why you will see 38-year-old investment bankers who vote for Bernie Sanders with action figures of Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, and there's a little replica of, a, of an AT-AT Walker, at -AT Walker from, um, from uh, The Empire Strikes Back on their desk. They're grown children, but they are in this religion, and the left has destroyed this religion. It hasn't just made bad movies, the left went into Star Wars because you can't have individualism, you can't have uh, bravery, you can't have courage, you can't go into a beat up old TIE fighter and, and fight against the power of the state, that's not allowed. So, you can't have this toxic masculinity, you can't have this bravery. So the left went into Star Wars, went chasing into it, and basically, not just made a bad movie, Star Wars survived many bad movies, they went into Star Wars and deconstructed Star Wars. I might as well stay on this, and if we have to do a third part for the, for the questions, it's fine. This is actually important. It's the most important work I do right now. They had to deconstruct Star Wars. And this is why the, left, why, why the entire generation is so angry at them. You ask millennials anywhere, in any room anywhere, and just walk up to a microphone and just say one thing. Just say, who shot first? That room will immediately respond with, Han shot first. In the original Star Wars movie, Han Solo is cornered by Greedo at the bar. Greedo points a gun at him, leveled a gun right at his head, says, I'm going to take you back to Jabba the Hutt where he's going he's gonna to kill you, uh, and, and I'm going to enjoy it. And Han Solo knows that he's not fooling around. So Han Solo uh, tries to keep the conversation rolling, reaches underneath his, um, underneath the desk, undoes his, uh, his, his uh, holster on his blaster, and when he's ready to be taken away and, and, and murdered by Greedo, he pulls the trigger and blows a hole in Greedo, blows a hole in the table, and Greedo falls down stone cold dead. And you see this in a movie theater, because I did see it in a movie theater in 1977, and people cheered. They jump, they only, there's only three, or three times, two, three times I've ever seen people jump out of their chairs in a movie theater. That was one of them, and the other one belongs to Harrison Ford. That was the time that uh, Indiana Jones uh, used his gun on that guy with the, with, the, with the swords. It was a visceral moment. It was visceral because you were so connected to this character in the state that you were in, this hypnotic state, that you had a sense of physical relief that this gun is no longer pointed at you because the gun is pointed at you. Um, so, no problem, except that in, oh, was it 97, 98, Lucas goes back, adds all these crappy special effects to the first movie, and then re-edits that scene, re-edits the scene where Greedo shoots first by a millisecond. So, if you get Star Wars now, it's like Greedo shoots and then Han shoots. Greedo, this professional bounty hunter who's sitting as far away from Han Solo as I am to you, has a gun pointed at him and misses, hits the wall, and then it's okay for Han to shoot because Han didn't shoot first. And when he was asked about this, George Lucas said, well, I just didn't want this guy to be a murderer. I, you know, we have kids to worry about. I want, I want to make a good, uh, you know, I want him to be a, 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 the kind of kids that they should want to make heroes. And the guy is too stupid. He's not too stupid. He's too deluded. There's a difference. He's too stupid to realize that the second Greedo put that gun on Han Solo, now it's him or Han. When, when, when Greedo pulled the gun, if Greedo had never pulled the gun 
and Han just shot him, you could make a case and that would really be morally objectionable. But when you've got a gun pointed right at you and a guy who tells you enthusiastically that he's going to take you to somebody who's going to have you tortured to death, and you shoot him, you basically in self-defense. He shot in self-defense. He shot first in self-defense. But they redid it. And even more disgusting is they destroyed every single copy. Of, well, when they destroyed it, they, they didn't release it again. You cannot find a version where Han shoots first unless you have a VHS copy of Star Wars from the 70s or 80s. They rewrote the history. And here's the problem for this generation that's raised on things like... Um, you know, uh, Spider-Man and Avengers and, and Star Wars. They're fans. They have a religious connection to these things, a religious connection to them. There's more than just a movie they like. They get dressed up, they go to San Diego, they go to, they, they, they dress, dress up in the costumes. It's, it, is their, it is their religious impulse. That's why they have little figures on their desk. People used to have figures of Jesus or crosses on the wall. Now they have figures of, of Yoda or Luke Skywalker or, or whatever the case may be. But the left went in there and they, and they destroyed the religion. And the reason they were able to destroy the religion is because of something called canon. So in, um, in, uh, in, you know, in Scripture, especially with the Catholic Church, there was this idea of canon, canonical law. In other words, you can't just make up stuff about Christianity. It has to come from authority. So it has to be some sort of authoritarian, top-down, the Pope says that this is the interpretation or whatever. And that means it's official, which means it's canon. Okay, C-A-N-O-N. -N. It's canonical. Now, when you've got something like Star Wars, where you have hundreds of millions, billions of fans, and all of them want to contribute something, and one person wants to make Han Solo into a, into a transvestite, and somebody else wants to make him into a Nazi or whatever, you have all of these fans with all these different opinions, and you have to have somebody who's going to be a judge or the referee, and the judge and the referee is Lucasfilms. You can have all the theories you want to, but once it appears in a movie or a video game or to some degree a book, then it's canon, and it can't be changed. And so they went into the canon of the religion and rewrote it. They turned the Messiah, who was the most hopeful, optimistic, courageous, young hero that we'd ever seen in movies, in the person of, Han so uh, of Luke Skywalker, who throws down his sword in the presence of a seven-foot-tall Nazi who has just destroyed entire planets because he still believes there's good in him. They turned that kid into a bitter, cranky, angry, murdering, lazy, uh, cynical bastard. And when the Jedi books, which are the code that this entire generation lived by, are burned by Yoda, Instead of throwing themselves in the flames to try and save them, Yoda says, it's in the past, let it go. It's the past, it's time to move on. Um, you know, we don't need that. We don't need that old writing on scrolls anymore. It's time for a new order. And you see in, the, in that movie that, okay, you got the forces of darkness with Kylo Ren, you got the forces of good with, um, uh, with Rey, and they end up shaking hands and uh, saying the answer somewhere in the middle, in that gray area between good and evil. And so good and evil disappears from Star Wars, and the emotional appeal of, good, of, the, of Star Wars disappears with it. And while they don't fully realize it, the millennials are out of their mind with rage because they destroyed their religion because they had the power of canon to do it. And to those people who say, but that's, that's insane. It costs them billions of dollars. They, they, they've ruined the franchise. That's not. Ruining the franchise is not a bug. That's a feature. Ruining the franchise is what they're trying to do. Uh, they're, they're fully conscious of this. When you have a fan base that's something like, I don't know what it is. Is, is it 88% male, something like that? 80%, 88% white male? When you have a fan base like that and you show up at a... At a uh, convention, and you've got the power to make the next Star Wars movie, which is going to determine canon, you're wearing a t-shirt that says the Force is female, you are basically telling three-quarters of your audience, kiss my ass. They destroyed it, and they destroyed it on purpose. And that's why the Solo movie tanked. It wasn't a bad movie. 
but they, there was an openly discussed, widely disseminated plan to boycott that movie out of anger at The Last Jedi. And then finally, some grown-ups whose uh, business sense trumped their um, politics, certainly not the case for the director and the producer of these last movies, but then the big guys got involved, Bob, Bob Iger, and he's like, that's a, you've just ruined you know, a $20 billion franchise. Oh, I'm sorry. They did it on purpose. So then they start walking it back. Did the exact same thing with Star Trek, right? I mean, they did the same thing with Star Trek. Star Trek was about Captain Kirk. It was about a man making decisions who was responsible for everything on his own, and he is America. It's America on the bridge. He is the moral compass of the Federation, and the decisions he makes are moral decisions based on, on what Americans believe is true. And then you go through all these different iterations. Next Generation is extremely left-wing. But Discovery is canon. You can't get away from it. They inserted this monstrosity before Kirk arrived. And you've got these, you've, Starfleet is now, you know, it, it, it's run by fashion designers, you know? And, um, and your hero is a, is, an, is a real angry, but very, very physically tough uh, young black woman who was raised on Vulcan, and, and her job is to basically go around with other female commanders and tell men what, what jackasses they are, and to lecture them on, on things like this. So, so that's gone. And um, you've got this, uh, look, I only saw, it, I've only been able to sit through 10 minutes of the entire Discovery first season. And, uh, and you've got this thing called the Spore Drive, which is driven by a guy who's like this. He's on a cross, suffering, physically suffering to make the ship jump, while his, his boyfriend is standing there telling him how much he loves him. Okay. That's, that's what Star Wars is, uh, Star Trek is now. And the Klingons are wearing their gold lame, uh, you know, neck braces, and, and, and it's dead. It's gone. And for years, I thought, why would they do this? Would they, they're losing so much money. They don't care. They're making millions. They, they destroyed the franchise because the franchise was dangerous to them. All of the stuff you see in the back, back of me here is da this, is dangerous to them. See that? That's got to go. That's got to go. That's a guy with a gun uh, and uh, an education. And, um, and so that has to be destroyed. And there's been a little bit of pushback. You know, Bob Iger uh, got involved with Star Wars. And then on Star Trek, they brought in Christopher Pike. And they still, you know, he looks a lot more. And he, bringing Christopher Pike in a yellow jersey, by the way. So they're, they're trying to steer this thing back into the realm of, of what the fans could tolerate. But I don't think it's going to work. So, millennials, go into computer games and watch these movies because it is a world where they get to act like conservatives. And entertainment, while Hollywood is incredibly left-leaning, unbelievable, is, it, Hollywood is so left-leaning that when a movie with Viggo Morganson, who I remember in 2003 wearing a t-shirt that he'd hand-marked with a marker saying no blood for oil just before the Iraq invasion, he's now a, a reactionary racist. Uh, and they couldn't find uh, Kevin Hart is not got the street cred because he's not left wing enough to host the Oscars. Okay. So so Hollywood is as left wing as it can get, but entertainment is inherently conservative. It's always conservative. It is one hundred percent conservative. Entertainment is conservative because James Bond does not confront the evil supervillain armed with a strongly worded letter from the United Nations and then drive off at a reasonable speed. They don't make movies about union leaders who go out and protest. They made one or two that were okay, but they were not nothing like blockbuster hits. Entertainment is about a guy with a gun. But uh, entertainment is about a guy with a gun uh, in a fast car rescuing the girl and fighting uh, evil. And no matter how hard the left tries, they can't get away from that. So the map is blue because they're told that they're blue. They have no chance to not be blue. And 
all of the things they say, all the things they do, the way they vote, all of that. Blue as blue can be. It's the end of the country. It's the end of the country. And if it's the end of the country, it's the end of the world. That map is real. That's what's coming if somebody doesn't do something about it. Now, here's the really good news. We don't have to spend 40 years on this because, as I say in, in this pitch when I've got this thing really on my game, you cannot beat the biology out of people. You can tell young men all you want to that they're defective girls and that they're potential rapists and, and that they should not play with guns. And they will nod and, 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 oh, no, you're right, no, absolutely. And then the second they're alone, they will go into a world where they get to use all the guns they want to and all the explosives and drive as fast as they want to and chase these hot chicks. Because you can't beat the biology out of people. You just can't do it. They did a survey of these social justice warriors, these young women. Asked them what they thought of the men who were the, you know, the feminists. The, the, what, what did they think about their woke uh, men of their generation? They said, we're not really interested in them. It's because they're not men. They, there's only so much granola you can chew trying to get laid, but it doesn't work that way, fellas. You, you, you can be as down with the cause as you want to, but you're still pajama boy sipping coffee out of a bowl and you're not doing anything for these young women because you cannot beat the biology out of people. So the conclusion of this is this. That map shows us how they vote. That map shows us how they think. But if you look at a map of what they do, it's red from sea to shining sea. They're not allowed to do these things in this world. And here's something else that you might want to think about. Especially when I talk to old people, they, they lament this so much. Oh, my son's lost. He's lost in the world of computer games. I haven't seen my nephew or my grandson. He's gone. He's lost to us. He's, he's in this world. We can't pull him out. And it's all very sad. But the world, and I enjoy telling this to old people because I only had this insight three, four weeks ago. The world that your grandson has disappeared into and not come out is a world that is more real than this one. When I say more real, I don't mean it's more graphically real. I mean the world of computer games is more like reality than the world of the social justice warriors. You get rewarded for work. You have to defend yourself. You take risks. You reap rewards. You fail. You get a chance to start again. You can be as bad as you want to or as good as you want to. They are in there to live the lives that their grandparents led because it's the only place where they're allowed to. So when you look at what they do, they shoot Nazis and they do it eight hours a day. And they spend $550 million to be cowboys and Indians. They, they, they spend $550 million dollars in three days so that they can play cowboys and Indians. Because it's the only place where they can play cowboys and Indians. If they tried to play cowboys and Indians in the real world the way that we used to do it, they would, they would never hear the end of it. It would be the end of them. They would be absolutely destroyed by these weenies and these losers. So they go to a place where they can be soldiers and cowboys and all the rest of this stuff and, and, and get away with it. And that's why you can't pry them away from it because you cannot beat the biology out of people. So what this means is very simple. We do not have to change the way they think. And even better, we don't have to change the way they behave. They're already behaving like conservatives. They're already making money. A game like EVE Online has battles that cost hundreds of billions, trillions of in-game dollars. But when there's a gigantic EVE battle, somebody once said something like two or three million US dollars vaporized because spaceships were destroyed in EVE that they'd paid real dollars to the company to upgrade. So capitalism is in there and everything else, and, and, and they, they have money and resources, and they steal mining colonies. They, they just do what people do. So they behave like normal humans after all. And so why are they voting for Bernie? Well, they're voting for Bernie because they're told that they have to vote for Bernie. But this is where the... Um, this is where... Uh, the final piece of not only good news, but great news is. It took him 40 years of owning 
all of these hypnotic outlets to convince us that our biology is lying to us and that they were telling the truth. That's why they have to shut BillWhittle.com down and Daily Wire and Alfonso Rachel because we just come out and say things that they know to be true. And here's what's interesting about that. If you have been lying to people for such a long time, when somebody speaks the truth out loud, it doesn't take 40 years. It, it just simply flips. It just plain shatters. The, um, the, uh, the key story here, key fable, is that of the emperor's new clothes. So how does that work? Because there's something about the emperor's new clothes that I did not realize. I didn't really realize the point of it. Because when you hear the story of the emperor's new clothes, you think that, oh, it's about this stupid emperor and how vain he is. Ha, 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 the joke's on him. But that's not the point. Here's the point. So just to recap, there's an emperor who's very vain and very stupid. And con men come to him and tell him that they've woven a fabric that is so unbelievably intricate and finely made that only people of utter refinement and great nobility can see it. And the king is very excited about this. Of course, he's, he's the freaking king. Let's see it. They go down and they pull open up the chest and they pull out the cloth and they show him nothing. And he is confused for a second, but as these guys say, you may see the way we've interwoven the gold and the blue and, and the shimmer that it gets is extremely delicate. Now, that, now the king is saying, wait a minute, this thing can only be seen by people who are very noble and, and courageous and good and, and, and smart, and I don't see it. Therefore, I am stupid or vain or bad. So what does the king do? Well, because he's a self-centered egomaniac who's trying to punch above his weight, he says, oh, you're right, that's incredible. He just goes along. Oh, God, absolutely, magnificent. In fact, it's so beautiful, I want you to make me a suit of these clothes right away. Um, well, it might be a little expensive, Your uh, your, your Majesty. Well, well, money's no object. What, what, what's it going to cost? It might cost 600 million gold pieces, which is pretty much all the money in the treasury, but he's going to spend it because he has to prove to people what a good king he is, and the way he can prove to other people what a good king he is, is by wearing this magnificent suit and going on a parade. So the con men go away. They come back two weeks later. They bring this, this kind of mannequin, and they start talking about all this stuff and how beautiful it is, and the king is, is really, you know, ooing and eyeing. And during the intervening two weeks, everybody at the court has heard about this. Everybody knows that this cloth is coming. Everybody's looking forward to seeing the cloth. They're all abuzz. The whole town is just vibrating. Cannot wait to see this, this unbelievably beautiful, magically beautiful cloth. And so the king walks out of the inner chambers after he's been changed into his underwear. And he walks into the court and everybody looks up. And nobody sees the cloth because there is no cloth there. But everybody makes the same exact assumption. Namely, I don't see the cloth. But I'm supposed to see the cloth because good people and brave people see the cloth. So I'm going to pretend to see the cloth because I don't want people thinking I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Oh, it's wonderful. But this, this is the point. This is the point, the entire point of, of the emperor's new clothes that most people don't get. Everybody is sending everybody else a signal that they see the cloth. In other words, when the king goes out for the big parade and there's a thousand people, every single one of those thousand people doesn't see the cloth because the cloth's not there. And every single one of them makes the same mental calculations. I can't be seen to be that stupid or that base. Therefore, I am going to make an enthusiastic display of how wonderful the cloth is. And that person's enthusiastic display of how wonderful the cloth is influences the guy on the other side of the road by convincing him that he himself is insane because everybody else sees it and I don't. So this is how it works. Everybody thinks that they are alone. Hey, we're, we're good today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. Everybody thinks that they are the only person who doesn't see the cloth, but since they send out so many signals that they do, then that's the indication for other people to believe it. 
And it is called social proof. And the beautiful thing about social proof is this. You do not then have to go down and talk to every single person on the line and say, he's not wearing any clothes. When one little kid says, but he's not wearing any clothes, he's naked, what does that do? It gives everybody else permission. It gives them permission to admit what they knew was true, but which they were too afraid to admit because they were so f afraid of the, of the response of their neighbors. When the kid says that he's not wearing any clothes because the kid's too young to feel this peer pressure, if he was a teenager, he'd have seen it by God, then everybody else in the parade says, the kid says he's not wearing any clothes. I don't see him wearing any clothes either because he's not wearing any clothes. He gives them permission. So these videos that we're doing are going to go into the computer game world. We're not making computer games. We're going to be producing videos and content that sits on top of Star Citizen, and then we'll do stuff that sits on top of Star Wars and sits on top of Star Trek. We're going to go right into the mainstream of the pop culture, which is where they are eight hours a day playing conservative, and we're going to give them the social permission to do these things in the real world. We're going to say, no, it's not. It's not evil. It's awesome. Capitalism is great. Um, and, uh, and guns are good. And why would you go out there to fight a dragon or, or you know, run a cargo run? Why would you do that without weaponry? Are you out of your mind? And no one is doing this. No one is doing this because nobody on our side gets it. But I get it, and, um, and you get it, once it's explained to you. And the most satisfying thing about this whole thing is this. I have gone into, uh, any Tea Party event or Republican event is gonna be older people. I mean, a young person in that room is in their 50s, it's 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I went to a group not too long ago which was the oldest room um, that I've ever been in. I mean, these women were in their, uh, the youngest ones were in their 80s. These were 80-year-old women, late 70s, 80s, and early 90-year-old women. And I made this pitch, and I told them about computer games, and I told them all this stuff. They've never seen a computer game. They don't have any idea what goes on in the computer game. But when I told them, that their grandchildren are in their room because it's the only place where they're allowed to do the things that they themselves did when they were young, play cowboys and Indians and shoot Nazis, they suddenly get it. And a lot of these people are pensioners. We had uh, donation envelopes on a table and a number of people put in $2. And I was more touched by that than anything I think I've ever had happen to me. This is, this is big, basically, here's all the money I have. So this is, this is where uh, I'm trying to, this is where I'm trying to take it. I'm trying to put a virus into the bloodstream and not just leave the medicine on the sidewalk and hope that somebody takes it. Speaking of medicine, uh, this is how I usually end this thing up. If you have a dog that's sick and your dog needs antibiotics uh, and it's a big pill and it tastes nasty, but your dog has to take it repeatedly, there are two ways that you can get that dog to take the pill. You can do it the Republican way, which is to grab him by his collar, wedge him firmly between your knees with one hand on the, on the collar until you've absolutely got him and he's panicking and screaming. And then you reach down to this dog and you pry his jaws open with all the strength you have. And while you're prying his jaw open, you shove this pill down his throat and you close his mouth and he's gotten his medicine. And that's how Republicans get medicine to people. They, they think that the way to get medicine into young people is to grab them by the collar, lock them down, pry their mouths open, and make them listen to Thomas Sowell for three hours or, or, or Jordan Peterson or, or whatever, and then they'll get it. But it doesn't work that way. The dog has that experience and the dog is gone, and you will have a hard time getting the dog to do it again, and every time you do it, the dog will get more and more suspicious and, and harder and harder and fight harder and harder and harder. That's the Republican way of getting the message out there. Um, 
the Democrat method of getting that dog to take that pill is to take the same pill and to wrap it in bacon, a lot of bacon. And then, instead of having to ram it down the dog's throat, the dog will eat the, the pill out of your hand. And once he's wolfed down that medicine, he will come back to you and beg you for some more medicine. And he will continue to do this forever. It's the bacon. And that's what we're doing. I've been standing in front of a burning lake of fire and in front of a virtual set, laying out these principles and talking to people's heads. The left has been getting them in dark rooms. Where they're fully relaxed and hypnotizing them into believing what they think they should believe, but they don't. They don't believe in wealth redistribution because they don't redistribute their own wealth. And they don't believe in, in sharing because they don't go and see movies about documentaries about, you know, about, about the labor movement. They go and see movies about heroes in fast cars driving guns and flying through the air and blowing things up. So we are going to go where they are. We're going to use the language that they're speaking, and we are going to give them the medicine inside a dog treat. They're never going to know they get the medicine. And the best part of all is that these Bernie Sanders socialists are going to start knocking on our doors wondering when the next pill is available. Uh, Cheryl uh, brings up the question that I've heard a few times. Uh, this applies mostly to men and, and playing games like Star Citizen and Call of Duty and all the rest of it. How does it, how does it uh, uh, deal with, how does it affect women? And the answer is... Um, the way, the way that we're going to reach young women, Foghorn says 46% of gamers are women. It's a, it's, a, it's a much bigger number, but I don't think their dynamic is quite the same. The better answer is this. The way we reach women is we reach, we reach millennial women by producing actual millennial men. If we give the men permission to be men and they act like men, then everything else will take care of itself. It just is biology. You can have a guy who's, you know, wearing the Obama t-shirt and a couple of tufts come along and it's like, oh man, we don't want to have any trouble. We're really down with, this, with the cause, you know. Uh, the, the, the white man is really, he's really dumped all over you and we're really with you on this 100%. And if you're the girl standing there, you know, you think, Okay, well, he said all the right things, and now we just hope and pray that these guys don't beat the snot out of us. Or you can be harassed by somebody on the street and then have, the, have that boyfriend go, guys, I'm not looking for any trouble here, but if you're going to you're gonna hurt that girl, you're going to have to kill me first. And look right him in the eyes. And then you tell me which one of those guys uh, the girl's going to go for. Because I already know the answer to that question. Um, so that's the plan. That's the out of the box, uh, plan. And I'm going to do it one way or another. Uh, but it means that I'm going to have to start insisting on things that I spent 10 years asking for, you know, I'm going to start, I'm going to have to start insisting that people carry their their own weight in this fight because to do this takes a lot of creativity but it takes a lot of money and not a lot of money it takes some money and uh i don't have the money to do all of this and so are we going to save this country yes or no i work on it 10 12 hours a day and 100 million people on and off have seen these videos and a couple thousand people have paid for them and when we were able to survive like that, we did. But they know the threat that we pause, uh, pose rather, and so uh, they are taking action, and now we have to take action in return. All right, so let's um, let's have a look at some of these questions because I promised I would do it. Uh, that's a happy coincidence. What are your concrete plans for turning this idea of video games into a lot viable business model that brings young people to the right? A lot of your backers are starting to worry their money's 
going to a fun distraction rather than something that's going to spread our message. Well, hopefully this helped you a little bit. Uh, these things these things go out for free. We're not allowed to make money on them. Um, and uh, this, if you happen to stick around for the uh, answer, Ian, I, I hope that did it for you. But if not, I can... I got a whole lot more evidence. I could talk about the guardian angels and how they basically inspired young criminals to do the right thing, and the young criminals became young policemen overnight for a red hat to belong because you can't beat the biology out of people. So I'm the only person that I know of out here that's working with biology, with the biology of millennials. I'm not working against their heads. I'm not telling them uh, that they should believe conservative ideas. I'm telling them, you know how you make 10 trips to that cave to kill that dragon so you can get 100 gold pieces so you can buy a bigger sword that you can kill a more expensive dragon with and, and make more gold pieces with. You know, those eight hours a day you spend doing that, it's called working. It's called going to work. You own a company. So if anybody's going to reach them, that's going to do it. Um, that's how they're going to reach them. Uh, Roy Hamill says, have you heard about positron dynamics? If it's, uh, let's have a quick look. There's a link. Cool name, cool website. Antimatter propulsion, fantastic. I am down. Uh, it's not really a gaming issue, so we can take it, uh, take it next time, but that is a very cool website, and I had not heard of Positron Dynamics, but like Xcore and, and Blue Horizons and Bigelow and all the rest, uh, it's private American citizens who are going to get us out of this, or or else they won't. Um, so I'll come back to that, Roy. If you want to bring it up, we'll do a space show. Uh, Eric Blake, I've been a little large chancellor of the Aurora Star Republic. I am a simple civil servant who is elected uh, to one term. Uh, so about the long apolitical Taylor Swift selling out to the left like she did in the midterms, I am somehow reminded of something a certain miserable lowlife whose name chronically escapes us says... Artists first and foremost are working for love, not money. That's true. Here's the thing. The left has been pressuring Taylor to get woke for a while now, taunting her about how the 4chan crew deem her the Aryan goddess and whining about her not sufficiently supporting feminazi causes. Meanwhile, has she gotten any social media encouragement from the right? Any tweets from conservatives encouraging her to stay strong? Nothing. Nearly as big as the pressure from the lefties, most of whom I'm willing to bet don't listen to her songs. So with that in mind... Is it in fact our own dang fault when celebrities who seem so promising sell out because we fail to support them? Yes. I'd like to sometimes, I'd just like to answer yes. That's perfectly expressed, perfectly thought out, exactly correct. What? You have to have a boy in the parade, right? There has to be one boy in the parade, one who says, he's not wearing any clothes. Somebody whose name is meant, who's recognized, somebody, somebody big needs to say, Taylor, you're not, not only are you not a racist, you are just doing the world a whole lot of good. And if you want to reduce it to its bare bones, you are making so much damn money and paying so much in taxes that you're doing more for poor Americans than anybody out there who's working for any of these left-wing causes who are giving you all this, this, uh, nonsense. They're writing tweets. You're making money, and your money is going to help poor people. Do we do that? Of course not. Of course not. We are so bad at rhetorical intelligence. This is really the issue. Conservatives are, are much more rational, much more sensible, much more frugal, much more, much more common sense. And they look at, that's kind of like the question I took a minute ago, uh, and it doesn't bother me. It's just, it's just the world that I have to operate in. A lot of people think that you're going to be going off having fun playing computer games when there's real work to be done on the messaging. And I'm saying I'm going to have the messaging presented to millions of people who are going to be voting for 40 years and they're not even going to know they're going to get the message. So it's going to cost me. It's already cost me. And, um, and it will continue to cost me. But I've never, 
never been so sure of anything in my life. That's why I'm here. I'm convinced. Um, that's why I'm on the earth is to do this. Um, mentioned earlier, Daily Wire, uh, you know, Crowder, uh, Peterson, all of them are fighting a great fight and they are holding the line. And they are winning some converts slowly, but mostly they're handing out ammunition to the conservatives who are out in college campuses and keeping them in the fight and keeping the idea of conservatism alive and shooting down the opposition. But they are frontline troops that are engaged in combat in the front lines. No one is going downstream. No one. No one is going, is going behind the lines and, and, and simply cutting off the oil supply. I'm just going to cut off the social proof. They're going to have all the tanks they want to. We're going to make sure they don't get any gasoline. They're not going to get any ammunition. Um, so uh, that's, that's the plan. Jake Coster, re -ask, what's your vote for the best sci-fi show on TV streaming right now? I say it's The Expanse, but I know many people who say it's The Orville. I have to tell you, Jake, I haven't seen either one of those. Uh, I just refuse to watch The Orville. I'm sure it's very good. I just... Um, I just can't do it. Seth MacFarlane is is just consciously. He, I, I just can't reward Seth MacFarlane. He knows what he's doing. Um, he knows what he's doing. Um, and uh, so I haven't seen it. I have seen bits of The Expanse. Uh, I like very much the idea of being in the solar system, I like the idea of it being real propulsion, I like the idea of bullets, all the rest of it, acceleration. That part of the expanse I just love. But um, there's nobody on that show that I like. The crew doesn't seem to me to be, there, there doesn't seem to be, there's plenty of diversity in terms of diversity of skin color, but there's no, there's no chemistry that I can see. Um, I like, I've seen a couple of episodes for the, um, for the effects, somebody's going to tell me that it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I, I've seen enough of it to, to, to feel like I'm just not interested in seeing much more of it. Um, but I'm sure it, I felt that way about the new Battlestar Galactica and ended up binge watching all seasons of it. But that's a possibility. But in any event, I don't, um, I, I, I don't find myself captivated by it. It reminds me of like above and beyond, and 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 you know shows like that 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 just haven't got they're cool but they don't have something about them is just not making the connection they're not they're not getting getting through uh paul johnson not a gaming question but i've always been curious what you think of chris nolan's interstellar did you like it uh i did like it i'm trying to remember what about it i didn't like because there was a lot about it that i didn't like i think there's something to do with the matt damon so, oh i remember the things i didn't like about it uh, i i <laughs> when when they launched the rocket from the library you know um i wasn't much impressed um i just hated the robot but i guess that doesn't make me unique i thought the idea of being down on the, the planet where the time dilation in effect i thought that was fantastic really good really clever idea i thought the the wormhole, uh, the as a as that kind of reflective sphere, the black hole uh, representation was tremendous. I thought the planets looked absolutely real and believable, and so did the the ships. Um, but by the time we got to Matt Damon, I was just, you know, the whole backstory didn't make any sense to me. Uh, and I have to tell you. Uh, I am, I am so sick of these Earth is dying stories. I mean, they're everywhere. Every science fiction movie, every single one of them starts out with, the Earth is dying, we've ruined our planet, we've killed the Earth, and now we must find another home. There's something coming up where they have to move to, they decide they're going to go live around Io, which has got the most radiation of any place in the entire solar system. They're going to go and move to Io because the Earth is too dangerous. Um, okay. Uh, so 
when I see Matt Damon, I can't get the politics of Matt Damon out of the picture, and that's the price that Matt Damon pays for um, thinking that uh, fame is a vehicle for his political opinion instead of his acting talent, which is enormous. I just won't go. I don't watch it. Uh, so that's that. Uh, but Inter I'll tell you what I did like about Interstellar. I saw just a little clip of it just a couple days ago, as a matter of fact. I've only seen it once. But at the end of that, where they, where they come back to the apartment, when he comes back to the apartment, the four-dimensional apartment, I began to realize, I mean, obviously, they're trying to show us four dimensions in two dimensions, not in three. But the special effects were fantastic. And the idea that every single direction at any single moment was an infinite frame of possibilities and that the frames went up and down and into the fourth dimension, I thought it was great. And I've always thought that, you know, we're so limited, we think, in, in, we think of infinity, but we, we also think that, well, if every single atomic state was different and it created a whole new universe, there's just simply no place to put them. That's, you don't understand infinity. And it got me thinking, um, if you had a Flatlander and you had a universe that was um, a circle, and, it was, and this circle was you know, 14 billion light years wide, if you were a Flatlander, you would think that's a lot of room. But if you also told him that this universe went 14 thousand light years up and down directions he can't get into in other words you could stack an infinite number of his universes one on top of the other just stack them one on top of the other then you would then he'd just have a hard time following it and that's i thought they did a real good job with that with interstellar uh top fan steve young um i have never done video games and i've heard that uh newbies are not warmly welcomed into shooter games we are a magnificent exception to that fact you don't have to play the game uh you don't have to be good at shooting you, don't, you really don't even need to play the game if you want to help out with the aurora republic uh i have not found the what you need information page at the aurora public ministry of information so what do our citizens and recruits need i'm going to be having a conversation with uh with a uh, known miscreant and um and uh and uh, the loudmouth about this uh in the in the very near future uh Foghorn says, uh, contact me, and the email address is aurora.republic.org at gmail.com. It is, in fact, a world where you do not have to play the game or own the game, and if you want to join the fun, you literally can just, you know, buy a, a, a game uh, package for, I don't know, is it 40 bucks, I guess, and then you can just walk on with us and just, just walk into a spaceship with us and come ride with us, and we'll do all the flying and all the shooting, and you'll see some cool things. Um, uh, okay. Um, known miscreant Mas Matt Lloyd, this will be the last question of the night, uh, says, um, why do the Ace-1 Eagles spend, uh, the Ace-1 is the uh, is um, Air Combat Element 1, it's the Eagle Squadron for the Aurora Republic. Uh, it's commanded by John Boyd. And, um, and uh, Matt Lloyd is, uh, is a fan of Ace-2, the wolf pack. Why do the Ace-1 Eagles spend so much time fussing over their girlish looks? Is it true they have vanities and bidets installed in each vanguard for maximum feminine hygiene, or are Eagles issued personal handheld douches? Well, that's a really good question, uh, Matt, and it's funny you mention it, um, because uh, I wasn't really going to do this, but now I think, I, I think it's probably time. Um, so let me let me show you what um, what uh, what Matt's talking about here. Just give me one second here. Name. That doesn't make any sense. So um, I, I can see where he's going with this. So let me uh, let me just show you uh, something here, guys. Um, here is uh, here's uh, the commander of of um, of the Eagle Squadron. Wait, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take him out of here though. So um, that's the commander of the Eagle Squadron. That's really kind of nice. Works out pretty well. Um, and his name is John Boyd. And as uh, as um, as uh, 
times Judd points out he, he thinks that the uniforms are effeminate, and in fact, he said that he thinks they look kind of gay, although not in a bad way. And he said that the wolf pack, which wears uh, red and black uniforms, uh, is much tougher and much more manly. And so um, that's a compelling argument to join the wolf pack. And so um, what we did was we, uh, we hired a photographer and we got um, a body double for um, the commander of the wolf pack because he was out, uh, I think he had a really bad ingrown toenail and he missed a week of combat on, on account of that. I forget his name now. It's it's a very unmemorable name. It's, uh, it's, uh, Ethan, something or other. Anyway, uh, he's he's the commander of the wolf pack, and he was basically saying that the eagles look kind of you know uh, gay because because they've got these kind of silver uniforms. So what we did was um, we went down to um, we got uh, the, we got the person who looked most like Ethan that we could find. And we went down to um, shoot some publicity photos for uh, for the Eagles and for the Wolfpack both. And and looking back on it, I realize uh, it's probably a pretty good gauge of of this theory and the uniform theory. So let me uh, just remove this, and uh, I'll show you some of the pictures that we uh, that we took there uh, just over the weekend. So I'm going to go to a black screen here. Um, hopefully the mic still works, and then I'll just drag these pictures in. Okay, there we go. Great. So um, we basically, as I said, we went down to a recruiting station at the mall, and we took um, a bunch of pictures. Uh, and um, and so I'm going to just leave it up to you guys to decide whether uh, you know the Eagles look kind of gay because they're in their shiny uniforms, or whether in fact the black and red uh, that um, that um, Ethan. Uh, advocates makes them look much more masculine uh, and this isn't Ethan but this is the person who we found who who looked closest to him so uh, let me see what I do with this here Hang on. I was hoping that would come into scale but it did not so uh, here's some of the pictures we took um, and you can see um, how uh, how tough uh, the black and, and red really look compared to the kind of the silver and the blue ones. Um, so uh, let me uh, delete this. We, we, we took a few more uh, just to see if we could get the, the point home. Um, uh, so um, come on. Yes. So uh, we went and we did, did a whole series of them. Um, here's another one uh, where we're trying to decide uh, Again, which one of these uniforms look better? I'm going to see if I can load it this way, and maybe it'll come in at the correct ratio. Hang on, yes, you. I'm going to give up bryos to you. So here's the second picture that we took. Uh, oh no, I have to scale this one too. Sorry, they're big pictures. Uh, again, you can see uh, that the that the black uniforms, uh, the black and the red, um, provide a, a a real kind of a masculine quality that I suppose are probably missing with our um, with our eagle uniforms. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had all our bases covered, so uh, I think we took a, a couple more. Um, let's see here. Uh, Here's one. Um, again, uh, it's it's kind of tough, you know, to be so badly at outclassed because the toxic masculinity on the part of the wolf pack uh, is really, um, you know, it's just sometimes it's just more than we can handle. But you're you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, Times Judge, he's um, you're right. The black and red is definitely. Uh, got a manly quality to it that I could see would definitely, you know, would appeal to you. Um, I think we have two more. Uh, so I uh, might as well just show the entire uh, entire series here while we're here. Okay, this one, this is almost one of my favorites. 
I'll let this one sit for a second. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I, I personally think that the silver uniforms look, look kind of cool. Um, but he may have a point about, you know, about the black and red being more butch. Um, what is their call sign again? Uh, oh. Oh, this foot's in the way. Um, and I think we have one more. Uh, let's get rid of this guy. So uh, for those of you who are out there playing along, um, it really is going to be a question of, uh, you know, you deciding uh, what you really want to do character-wise. And uh, I know, just speaking for myself, that um, I personally like the, the silver and the blue because they're the colors of um, the Aurora Republic. They're the colors of you know, high altitude. Oh, I just did that one, sorry. Let me bring that one, bring in the next one. That was my mistake. Uh, where is it? So I, I leave it up to the reader uh, to decide, uh, the viewer. But basically, um, here we go. Here's the last one. So you uh, you do have a, a choice of, of uh, which squadron you decide you want to join um, in the Aurora Republic. So uh, if you do decide that you're one of those people who don't normally play the game and you'd like to play the game, um, you've got your choice uh, between the um, the presumably kind of gay-looking uh, eagles or the um, or the, the the black and red. Uh, of uh, you know of of the wolf pack, so um, uh, I think I'll just leave you with that image. It's it's pretty much your choice. Uh, I kind of prefer the eagles personally, but I just don't have the same taste in clothes and colors that uh, that the, that the wolf pack has, and I certainly don't know how to pose as well as they do. Um, hey, Foggy, can you send me the link to the? Um, can you resend that link? to the uh, to the uh, cyclone jump thing we actually are um, we wear these colors because we we stay up high we um, we shoot down uh, enemy targets at four or five kilometers and we don't roll in the mud uh, like a bunch of yapping puppies that have you know, rolling around in their, in their own uh, stuff. All right, I gotta download this foghorn. So give me a second here. Uh, in any event, you can look at that picture for a moment while I get this thing downloaded, and that'll do it for the day here. But we will have a chance to see this. This was put together. Also, a fun little thing that we do just for giggles here. By the way, I just want to point out that this, uh, for those of you who may be watching on Media Matters, uh, this is uh, what you're looking at here is not a question of uh, of gay. It's just a question of fabulousness. And uh, I think I can say with a fair amount of confidence that, uh, that the, the Wolf Pack is the most fabulous squadron in the entire Republic. Uh, okay, so let's see, where's it? Uh, YouTube Ripper, I'll run this and then we'll call it a night. Uh, but this is the kind of fun that we have online uh, and it's nice to be able to, to have some fun and save the country. Um, and as usual, the problem with, see if I had an engineer.
It's the space bar. It's the space bar. I keep hitting the space bar, uh, and um, that mutes the microphone. I might want to think about changing that uh, that hotkey. What's going on here? Okay, uh, this was one of the most disjointed shows ever. And um, nevertheless, there we are. We're back, and uh, and we do have a lot of fun out there. So um, I suppose until next time, uh, we will do something different, uh, and uh, presumably I'll get a little bit more sleep. So um, until then, uh, thanks very much for joining us. It was... Uh, real and it was fun but it wasn't real fun it's always real fun thank you very much to the members that make this possible and um we have good things coming your way and uh i think he's finally left now that no good for nothing it's got out lay about sluggard uh yeah anyway i'm just completely babbling now which is pretty much par for the course see you next week <laughs>